Good morning. I'm Peter Kovacs. I'm the editor of The Advocate, and welcome to our virtual town hall with Sharon Weston Broom, uh, the mayor president of Baton Rouge. Um, we are um, it, at the Advocate building on Rieger Road. There are like seven people in this room, so we're complying with all the, uh, all the health orders. Um, the mayor showed up rocking a mask. She That's looked good right. in it. That's right. And, um, so we're going to take uh, your questions that you submitted uh, online, and um, uh, the mayor asked that we just charge in with the first question. Let's get to it. So here's the first question from uh, Steve of Old Goodwood. Um, how many active cases of COVID-19 does, does the parish have? Well, as of uh, today, we have uh, over 4,000 cases, uh, 4,398 uh, cases, and uh, unfortunately, 265 deaths in East Baton Rouge Parish. And, and Peter, if I can elaborate a little bit on that, you know, uh, yesterday the uh, governor had a press conference uh, stating that we would not be moving on uh, to another phase. And I certainly understand his concern because as the uh, mayor president, I share that concern and I will probably uh, not probably, I will be coming out uh, uh, with another message to our community uh, this week because what I have noticed, my observations just going around town, a few mm -hmm. events, that it seems like once we got into phase two, mm -hmm. that people were uh, a little relaxed mm -hmm. about implementing uh, social distancing, wearing masks. I mean, we need people to wear masks. We need people to practice hygiene. Now, the good um, part of this is that since this whole COVID-19 pandemic started, we have now 22, over, about 22 testing sites where people can go and get tested. And so, you know, that certainly helps the cause. But people, you know, we've got to wear these masks. I know people don't like to, but I'm gonna just tell you, when I go to a business, I'm looking to see if the people serving there are wearing masks, and I'm also observing if they have good uh, hygiene practices that they're implementing. Yeah. And so if they aren't, you walk out or you uh, scold well, so them, far, or what so, do you do? <laughs> look, so far so good, I haven't had to walk out, okay. but I do hold people accountable. You know, I, I was in a store, and I, I know we have a lot of questions, okay. but I was in a store Saturday and uh, they practice, I mean, they have signs up saying you can't come in without a mask, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I saw uh, one of the individuals in the store, one of the patrons, say to one of the employees, uh, why aren't you wearing gloves? I noticed some of you all wear gloves and some of you all don't wear gloves. And so that patron was you know, asking a question and holding the employee uh, accountable. Mm -hmm. So. I believe we have to do that moving forward. The last thing I want to see us do is regress and go back to a stay-at-home order. Okay. So you, you expect that whatever you issue will more or less mirror the state, um, as it most parishes the, have. It will yeah. mirror the state, but, you know, every area has its own personality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've been receiving emails from individuals who want me to mandate wearing masks. I have yeah. a, a good friend, a supporter, who wants us to mandate wearing masks. But I will tell you, I don't think mandating folks wearing masks is the route to go. Number one, how do you enforce that? Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, I believe people have to be personally responsible uh, for their health and understand it's the neighborly thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the humanitarian thing to do because when I wear a mask, I protect you, and when you wear a mask, you protect me. Yeah, that was actually the next question from Peggy of, of Brownfield was like, what? And, and you hear that a lot, like requiring people to wear masks, yeah. but short of like arresting them, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, we, on, on the public safety space, mm -hmm. I believe that our citizens would want uh, our officers to spend time more uh, working on making sure that our streets are safe and people are safe mm -hmm. than trying to sure. uh, enforce folks wearing a mask. And so, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I just think that people have to understand the reality of uh, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And we saw a big outbreak this past week mm -hmm. and uh, in the LSU area at some mm -hmm. of the bars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so 
where there perhaps once was a sentiment that it was yeah. only impacting uh, seniors, perhaps, as a vulnerable part of the yeah. population and folks mm -hmm. with an underlying health conditions. Mm -hmm. Now we see people of all ages who yeah. are being impacted. So you just can't assume, oh, it's not going to happen mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Okay. What do you say to people who say, um, you know, health officials were all upset about the students at the Tigerland bars and all that, but nobody's saying anything about the demonstrations, which were also young people and uh, also were, some wore masks, some didn't. Um, they weren't social distancing. Yeah. And what do you say about that? So uh, I've heard that question uh, and that concern. Uh, first of all, let me just say that uh, the protesters, the peaceful protesters, I believe, uh, uh, realized that they were in a, a moment that they could not sit back and wait for the, a pandemic to be over. Mm -hmm. But I do know here in Baton Rouge at some of the peaceful protests mm -hmm. that people have been wearing masks. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I look around the country on television, I notice a lot of the protesters are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that it's a fact that when large crowds gather that the um, COVID-19 will surge. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that we are in a very unique situation just in history right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of civil unrest. Mm -hmm. And for those of us here in South Louisiana, we're in the middle of hurricane season. Mm -hmm. And so it's juggling all of those and all of those, those situations have some intersection. Mm -hmm. And so my encouragement, I will tell you, is I always encourage everyone to wear a mask if you're out and about, if you're part of a peaceful protest, you know, wear a mask. We've even passed out masks to people. Uh, okay. So. okay. Um, this comes from uh, um, Corliss, uh, who says, um, why is it that our state's governor is continuing to loosen restrictions going forward through the phases as the numbers of cases continue to rise? Of course, he didn't exactly loosen them, but he didn't tighten them either. Um, so what's your view of that? Yeah, I, you know, I have been on a number of calls with uh, mayors and parish presidents from across the state uh, with the governor. And as I said a few minutes ago, each area has some uniqueness in terms of uh, the peak of, uh, of COVID-19. I don't think that the, I think the governor yesterday certainly showed that he's not relaxing the standards because mm -hmm. if he were he would say let's move on to phase uh, uh, phase three yeah. but we all as leaders have to be driven by the data uh, surrounding COVID-19 mm -hmm. it's not a you know maybe today we'll do this and maybe tomorrow we'll do that it's what does the data say okay. and so um, I'm looking at the data I'm looking at if there's some unique situations in Baton Rouge that maybe we need to uh, tighten up. Uh, and I will make that judgment this week based on where we are in uh, phase two and what our numbers look like. Okay. Is there a possibility of returning backwards to phase one? I sure don't want to see us go back to phase one. You know, I do want us to have and it's imperative that our citizens are healthy. You know, we can't compromise the health of our citizens. At the same time, I believe that it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive as we uh, uh, get our businesses and our economy back up and running. But I think they have to work hand in hand. That's why I'm saying these businesses have to be accountable. If we don't want to go backwards, if we don't want to close things, then I need our businesses to comply and make sure that their employees are complying. Okay. Amy asks, says, uh, many individuals with higher risk of serious complications should they contact COVID-9 are either voluntarily housebound or involuntarily housebound in nursing homes or assisted living centers. In order for these individuals to safely go out anywhere to get even the most basic needs, the recommendation that everyone wear a mask needs to be enforced. Without these steps, these people will be continue to be homebound and vulnerable. 
Yeah, you know, um, the, the nursing homes are a culture in and of themselves, right? Yeah. You have the most vulnerable population there of people who are fragile in many instances, and we've seen a lot of the peaks take place in nursing homes. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe that if we're going to stabilize, and I hope I'm touching yeah. her question, and I feel yeah. like it's been wrapped up in yeah. the conversation yeah. around COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, we need more people um, like this lady saying to your neighbors and your yeah. friends and everybody yeah. else, wear a mask. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I um, had recently, I was invited to somebody's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I went to their ho home, they sent a text message and they said, look, we're practicing social distancing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can wear a mask when mm -hmm. you come in. Uh, although, you know, we love you and stuff, there'll be no hugging and hand touching <laughs> yeah. and yeah. things like that. And mm -hmm. so these are the messages that we individually have to communicate to our neighbors and to our friends, you know, and, and so I, I don't want to see people in bondage, but we've got to adhere to wearing masks, we've got to adhere to social distancing, and we've got to adhere to, uh, you know, good hygiene practices. We can't relax that. Yeah, okay. This comes from uh, Philip in Shenandoah. It's a different subject. Um, now that the people have spoken, and Governor Edwards has signed the transition bill into law, will you commit to dropping the frivolous lawsuit against the incorporation of St. George? <laughs> so. uh, first of all, love that question. Okay. Is that from Philip? From Philip of yeah, Shenandoah. Philip, Philip. Okay. love that question, okay. Philip. Uh, first of all, it is not a frivolous lawsuit. The lawsuit is in compliance with the law, which gives me the ability to ask these individuals uh, who promulgated uh, the proposal of St. George mm -hmm. to demonstrate to this city and parish that they are uh, capable of sustaining a city of 86,000 people uh, without negatively impacting the entire city and parish. Uh, the transition bill is not into effect until the lawsuit is over. Mm -hmm. So the transition bill, you might say, is a placeholder mm -hmm. until uh, the lawsuit is over. Uh, and lastly, let me say this. Um, all of the people did not speak as it relates to uh, the proposed city mm -hmm. of St. George. Uh, there are thousands of people who are not in agreement with it. Mm -hmm. I understand the electoral process, but if you look at how everything was rolled out with that, mm -hmm. there was, a, as you know, a carved out area of people mm -hmm. who were given the ability to vote. Mm -hmm. And it was done strategically. Uh, listen, uh, and let me, let me broaden this discussion around St. George. Okay. Uh, before I became mayor president, mm -hmm. uh, when I ran for office, it was certainly a uh, big issue right. during the campaign. Yeah. And during that time, I said that I was not for fragmenting our city uh, anymore, right? Our parish anymore. And I believe this is couched in what we're dealing with right now, Peter, in America. Mm -hmm. It, no, you know, People want to uh, live together, black, white, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your Democrats or Republicans or independent. Mm -hmm. That is what a lot of what we see right now in terms of the civil unrest. Of course, the promotion of the civil unrest uh, took place with the advent of the killing of George Floyd and people saying enough is enough as it relates to uh, police 
Uh, and we and I hope somebody has a question yeah, on there that. There are too. there are police yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we Don't worry, those that. are coming. We can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. But even in the midst of what's going on with the civil unrest about uh, the treatment of police with citizens, there is still there there is is also couched in that a hue and cry for racial equity, uh, for people. Uh, uh, the, the cry for humanity, for people to live together, to work together, to share together, uh, you know, that united we stand, not divided we stand. And so that message is couched in what is going on right now. And my heart's desire from the very beginning of running for office till right now is that we would see ourselves as a united community with shared goals, with shared visions. Mm -hmm. The people in Shenandoah, like Philip, uh, the people in Scotlandville want the same thing that the people uh, in Shenandoah want. Mm -hmm. And so we have the ability as a city and parish to unite around shared goals and shared visions and not, you know, divide every time, you know, we, don't, we believe we are better off by ourselves. Mm -hmm. that, that is not what, community is about. Okay. So is the, the status of the St. George matter is that the, the whole thing is suspended while the lawsuit is going on and probably courts are suspended while the pandemic's correct, going on. And so, so there's no action on St. George. Going no, on. Okay. I mean, it, the transition bill uh, okay. that the uh, proponents of St. George uh, uh, advocated for during the legislative session mm -hmm. uh, passed but there is an amendment that says nothing takes place with that transition bill until the litigation is, is over with. Okay. Uh, you know, in the meantime, it's you know, my hope and prayer that we can once again yeah. unite around shared goals and shared visions. Peter, you know what yeah. I have noticed about this city and parish, uh, in addition to it being resilient, I've noticed that in times of crisis and challenges, mm -hmm. we all come together. In the flood. In the flood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With COVID-19. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a hurricane, we all come together. We have our kumbaya moments. Mm -hmm. We serve one another. Mm -hmm. We love one another unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Why can't we make that a way of life? Yeah. Why mm -hmm. can't we make that a way of life? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I believe that should be the fabric of our community. Yeah. Okay. One last St. George question before we move on to other topics is: Is the status of if if a giant Volkswagen eating pothole opens up in St. George, um, is it your pothole right now? Oh yes. Okay. I, it's, it's, it's my pothole. It's, it's my pothole. Okay. And you know that's the other side of the the coin is that uh, even in the midst of the uh, St. Uh, George advocacy, you know, the advocacy for a city of St. George. Mm -hmm. When we did our MOVE EBR program, mm -hmm. when we, uh, when uh, the team of individuals decided uh, what projects would be in the queue, yeah. uh, there was no discrimination or prejudice against St. George. Mm -hmm. The, the projects were equally distributed mm -hmm. across all the council districts. So there was no politics involved in that. And so mm -hmm. why do I bring that up? I bring that up to show that mm -hmm. I, as mayor president, I, I, I represent people who live in that area just like I represent people who live in other areas. Mm -hmm. And once again, it is my, uh, my desire and my goal that we would unite around okay. basic principles that we all agree on. Okay, well, let's get to the, to the road program, which... Um, was, one of my well, favorite yeah, subjects. One of your favorite subjects, because, <laughs> um, because you're fixing a yeah, bread break dirt somewhere. Yeah. And, um, and, and really was, you know, kind of one of the big accomplishments of, of this term was, <clears throat> was, was you got that pass. Yeah. Um, I, I know one question people ask is, like, when am I going to see some actual road construction Great occurring? Great question. Okay. Great question. Mm -hmm. So um, there will be movement, no pun intended, on mm -hmm. Move EBR this yeah. year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have some specific uh, roads and projects that okay. you can look forward to uh, this year. 
uh, Picardy and Perkins extension. That's one. Okay. The Ben Hur Road realignment, two. Okay. McHugh Road upgrade, Piku Lane expansion, and sidewalks for 72nd uh, Avenue. So those are some of the projects that are underway in uh, 2020. But as you know, this is a 30-year uh, tax. We anticipate being finished with the programs uh, and projects in, within 50, 15 years, excuse me, um, in 2020. And this is a good thing right now, Peter, considering COVID-19. Move EBR has been an economic and will be an economic driver in 2020 as we talk about recovering from COVID-19 because we have uh, 46 million taking place in direct spending. We've awarded $85 million, 30 new contracts in, um, in, in this uh, year. Um, we estimate that we're gonna create over 1,300 jobs and already 33% of our projects are going to uh, small and minority businesses. Uh, so we, we are, this, this program is making an impact economically as well as fixing uh, some needed pro uh, challenges that we okay. have with uh, roads and traffic in Baton Rouge. Okay. Did the, presumably there's a sales tax shortfall occurring because of the economy, oh, although I guess with a 30-year program that doesn't make that much difference. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. For MOVE EBR, of course, it, it, it what is taking place with COVID-19 does not impact this program. Okay. Our overall budget, mm -hmm. however, uh, right now we're estimating uh, perhaps a $20 million uh, shortfall. Mm -hmm. uh, but the verdict is still out on that okay. uh, as we look at uh, um, our revenues coming in. But you can probably just get a snapshot of uh, expectations just by um, the movement of businesses coming back on into uh, the economy, uh, people going back to work. Mm. So, uh, but I, I, I believe that we will we will uh, survive, and I also believe that we will we will thrive. I'll tell you, mm. we've got a um, group of uh, business people mm. who have been part of my. Um, Mayor's Business Roundtable, and we expanded it, and these people are uh, focused on restarting Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Restart. And so uh, they've been making recommendations on how we can continue uh, on a week-by-week, -week, month month-by-month basis and remove barriers and encourage businesses <coughs> as they uh, move towards uh, restarting. Okay. Um, speaking of which, what is the effect of, you know, tax revenue on the parish and are, are like, are there going to be layoffs? Are there going to be furloughs of people? Um, what, what's yeah. going to happen with that? Well, I am uh, very thankful uh, to say and uh, to say this about city parish government. Uh, we have nearly about approximately 4,000 employees mm -hmm. and uh, during the COVID uh, 19 uh, crisis, we have not laid off any of our employees and mm -hmm. we have not furloughed any of our employees. And, and that's something I, I, I want to emphasize mm -hmm. um, because when you go around and have, do an informal survey mm -hmm. uh, and just within your family or friends or your circle, mm -hmm. you'll identify individuals who were either laid off, maybe some of them were, uh, uh, furloughed, but uh, we were able to keep everybody getting a paycheck uh, during this time. A lot of our uh, employees did work remotely at, mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, we had, and I have to give our city parish employees a shout out, uh, many mm -hmm. of them have worked as essential employees throughout this pandemic, mm -hmm. making sure that basic services are maintained and have been maintained uh, mm -hmm. during this uh, time. and. I will tell you, we've had conversations with other uh, leaders in other cities, and mm -hmm. they have had to furlough people. They've yeah. had to lay some yeah. people off. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk for a minute about policing. Um, one of the things that you've said is that the, the strength of the union is an impediment to reform. Um, could you give like, could you discuss that and maybe give examples of where they've been an impediment uh, to reform? 
Well, let me just say this, <laughs> um, because somebody said uh, something to me the other day. I, I, I believe, I'm gonna start with this question, mm -hmm. with this response. Uh, I believe in the value of unions and taking care of workers' rights, making mm -hmm. sure that they get what they deserve, et cetera. Uh, but, and so I don't paint a broad brush over all unions, right? Okay. Because uh, uh, somebody made this statement uh, to me the other day that was certainly a misnomer. Mm. Uh, but I will tell you that with the police union, mm. uh, and this is in record, you know, mm. uh, it, it's, it's not something that I have concocted. Mm. If you look over um, the years past mm. in terms of discipline mm. and how there has been protection of some officers, no matter how egregious, mm. um, uh, their uh, behavior has been, mm -hmm. then it makes you question the union. Is that, what are you doing? Are you really committed to 21st century policing? Are you really committed mm -hmm. to the greater good? And I think we get confused with that sometimes. <coughs> you know, the police union is a police union. Mm -hmm. But let me just tell you this. We have a lot of wonderful, effective, great committed police officers who work for the Baton Rouge Police Department. Mm -hmm. But we also have some that have demonstrated bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And so bad behavior should not be condoned. Mm -hmm. And if I were the union, I would want to make sure that those people who are demonstrating bad behavior don't give everyone else a bad name. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, the discipline is one big area that you can track. Go back to some of the civil uh, police and fire civil service uh, board hearings. Look at that uh, documentation. Look at uh, you know the the relationship that <laughs> has taken place sometimes between um, Chief Murphy Paul and and uh, measures that he's tried to implement and the pushback that he has received. You know he had a bill last year where he was trying to, and the bill did get passed, where he was trying to give more opportunities for police officers who uh, demonstrated uh, effective, uh, insightful, meaningful, qualified, experienced behavior, visionary leadership, who wanted to apply for some of the hierarchy jobs that were tied up uh, you know, by civil service. And so another best practice that's taking place. So he was able to get legislation to open up a few positions to give officers who have uh, a heart and desire to serve in leadership an opportunity for this. Well, he was, he was fought on that to the nail by the, by union. the union. Okay. And uh, fortunately it did pass. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so I don't like for people to get it twisted, you know. Okay. We, the, the union is the union, but the Baton Rouge Police Department is the Baton Rouge Police Department. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I work with four great officers mm. on a regular basis. These, these officers are, are part of my security detail, mm -hmm. and I have conversations with them. Mm. They have been out in the, in the field. They've mm. been out in the trenches. You know, uh, it, and it's a diverse, it's a diverse group, mm -hmm. and and so I, I know that they are great people. I I have four of them that I yeah. work with on a regular basis, and many yeah. others that I uh, encounter. But we've got to continuously improve our department. Uh, we've got to close the gap. And let me just tell you, with as these national conversations have been going on, mm -hmm. we have done that work. You know, we've done the work of use of force policy, of de-escalation, of officer uh, uh, wellness, of body cameras, but we still have room to go. We still have to continuously make it a top priority to close the gap between our officers and the citizens that we serve. And, I, you know, I'm very thankful for the leadership of Chief Murphy Paul uh, because he 
as someone used this term the other day with me, uh, uh, a millennial, he's present, mm. you know? Okay, that's a, that's a good description. All right, this comes from Reginald of North Baton Rouge. And he says, I want to know why Baton Rouge is constantly, why North Baton Rouge is constantly neglected year after year when it comes to legitimate businesses, economic development, and any beautification around Southern University or in Scotland, Bill. There are no grocery stores, pharmacies, doctor's offices, restaurants outside of fast food, affordable housing. There's no need for any more liquor stores or tire shops. I agree with him on, on the <laughs> liquor stores and tire shops. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you, Reginald, that we've been uh, moving the needle in uh, North Baton Rouge under my administration. And what you have to understand, uh, and I believe you, you, you see it if you are a resident there, that there has been a continuation <clears throat> of disinvestment, mm. decades of disinvestment that have happened in that area. So when I came in office, one of my priorities, and, and mm. I'll tell you, Peter, I got a little criticism for that. Because mm. I kept talking about wanting to uplift North Baton Rouge or any community of disinvestment, recognizing mm. that when we do uh, one community, it elevates the entire city and parish. So mm. let's talk specifically about some things that have gone on and are going on. First of all, let me give a shout out to organizations like the North Baton Rouge Blue Ribbon Commission and the uh, North Baton Rouge Economic Development uh, uh, Group uh, and uh, Scotlandville CDC. You know, you've got a lot of organic organizations that have taken upon themselves to help with beautification, uh, to help with uh, Scotlandville Saturdays, et cetera. So, those are some things that have been happening organically. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what I did when I uh, came in office, we started our equity and business seminars mm -hmm. to empower uh, minority businesses in terms of opportunities to get uh, contracts with city parish government, and we've moved the needle with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also now uh, brought Howe Place back alive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got Ocean's Healthcare coming in there, Behavioral Health Center. That place was closed uh, for years, and that was one of the comments that has uh, been made. Uh, what's going to happen with Howe Place? You know, we have the Plank Road Corridor Project, which is a visionary project from Bill Baton Rouge that's going to transform uh, uh, North Baton Rouge. Um, I'm, we've, we've got the grocery store issue. So one of the things that we've done, uh, immediately we engaged HOPE, uh, CDFI, uh, an organization that has helped uh, bring grocery stores to communities. Uh, they were effective in New Orleans after Katrina, and they are working with us now, identifying uh, sites. Uh, we've also got people like Associated Grocers working with us, trying to identify sites where we can close um, the gap, the grocery store gap. But in the meantime, we didn't just wait for a grocery store to eat, to develop. We've been closing that grocery store gap with our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative and our Go Get Healthy program. We've been having fresh food and produce uh, uh, going around the community through Grow Baton Rouge. Uh, we've got the Baton Roots Project where people can go and uh, get involved with uh, gardens. We've got a top box where foods are being delivered to churches and community centers that people can pick up. So we've been working on closing that gap as we have simultaneously been working on making sure that uh, grocery stores not only come to North Baton Rouge but in areas of uh, dis disinvestment, a top priority. One of my messages, and sometimes I feel like I, uh, you know, I sound like a broken record with this, but you know, repetition is essential. You can't have part of your community at a D grade and part of your community at an A grade and think you have a thriving, successful community. You gotta get that D grade up. And that is what we've been working on. And so I know a lot of people get it. I know a lot of people in the city and parish get it. We've, I've had communication with them, but it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing process. Um, okay. Um, uh, a, um, what, is, what is going on with evictions? Yeah, well, you know, um, 
the governor uh, lifted evictions, I want to say on June 5th. Mm. Uh, and uh, so during the time of COVID-19, uh, folks were um, asked, landlords were asked to um, cease with evictions in order to help through this process. But uh, evictions have now uh, been uh, reinstated. And um, that, that's pretty much the beginning and the, and the end of it at this uh, point. I don't, um, I don't see us going backwards in that unless we start moving backwards in the whole COVID-19. Okay, so this, uh, the eviction curtailment is over yes. and, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, one, one police question I didn't get to is um, the, uh, one of the goals was to, uh, was to have raises for police officers mm -hmm. and that part of it um, hasn't hasn't been achieved, correct, correct. and it looks bleaker now than it looked a year ago. But what's the status of that? Well, um, <clears throat> police raises is still uh, part of the agenda. What happened? Um, I want to say over a year ago when we brought in our efficiency mm -hmm. uh, experts and consultants, yeah. they identified efficiencies uh, in the. Uh, that could take place in the Baton Rouge Police Department. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Chief Paul is outlining a process uh, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, in the meantime, there, there are other financial issues that uh, we've encountered with the police department in terms mm -hmm. of retirement issues, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but listen, I understand um, that our officers are um, on the lower end of the scale from a statewide perspective in terms of pay. Uh, I also understand that right now uh, we are in a season where it's vitally important for our officers to build trust with the citizens that they serve. That's vitally uh, important. So as we navigate this season of building trust, uh, with the citizens and closing that gap between citizens and the police, um, then I believe that the the uh, um, you know the affirmation uh, will be given in terms of of timing uh, with this. But I, I think Chief Paul has been uh, certainly looking at the impl I know he mm -hmm. has been looking at the implementation of that. Okay. Okay. Those um, efficiencies. Okay. Uh, last topic in in, <clears throat> in a lot of communities, there <clears throat> have been movements to erase the names of Confederates from mm -hmm. streets and monuments and the LSU. Um, well, no, that what that didn't relate to that. But um, uh, Lee High School um, is uh, is any of that? Are you are you proposing any of that? Is any of that going in Baton Rouge? On in Baton Rouge, should Lee Road be renamed? Um, in the context of the high school being renamed? Let me just say that um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, was part of the fabric of slavery. Uh, last year uh, was the uh, recognition of uh, the 400th anniversary of uh, blacks uh, slaves uh, being kidnapped and brought to America, mm. uh, to Jamestown. Mm. Um, we are in a season where people are recognizing uh, that there are symbols that continue to promulgate racial division and are, mm. are a painful reminder of our past as we try to live in the present. Uh, so I certainly uh, understand uh, and support uh, the assessment of symbols, whether they're streets, whether they're names of schools, et cetera, that are painful reminders of a racial divide. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons uh, uh, that I established our Commission on Racial Equity and Inclusion uh, was to ask those people that serve on that commission to look at these symbols, to look at these uh, painful reminders uh, of, 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 of slavery uh, uh, that exists and, and racial injustice, and offer an approach to either 
renaming streets, uh, uh, looking at uh, statues that may need to be uh, removed. Uh, I think the school board uh, made a wonderful step in the right direction in terms of renaming uh, Lee High School. Uh, I, I have no objection and I support uh, renaming uh, the street in front of uh, Lee High School as, as well, and I believe there are many people in the community. But this is the point I want to make, which yeah. is why I said that the commission is going to look closely. When you look at our history in Bat Rouge, as I said, we were, we, 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 you know, we were one of the vestiges of, of, of slavery here in the South. And so if you look all around our community, you know, we've got 7,000 streets. And I know that about four, four of those streets have been named in that area, but there's a lot of other streets that have uh, names uh, that certainly are not unifying names for a community. Uh, so we have to, I would like to see us approach, approach these symbols, these streets holistically and prioritize how we want to approach it. But even more importantly, well I shouldn't say more importantly, but it is also significant that not only do we uh, remove symbols that remind us of a, a, a torrid past, but that we also make sure that we are promoting uh, 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 in this present moment uh, the removal of systemic racism from institutions that exist in our city and in our, in our parish, in our community. Uh, that we look at our city and parish through a lens of equity and inclusion, of racial equity and inclusion when it comes to uh, business development, economic development, uh, contracts. You know, I was so pleased to see that, like I said, with our Move EBR program, we've given over 30% of our contracts thus far to small and minority businesses, to opening up opportunities for people, to making sure that uh, uh, the color of someone's skin does not dictate their ability to thrive and succeed in East Baton Rouge Parish. And those are the things I want to look at. I, I, I am charging this commission to look at as well. Okay. Well, we appreciate you coming by. That's, it's uh, over. that's all our time. Yeah, yeah. You, you said you had to get back to work. So <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I wanted uh, to make sure you get to get back to work. So we appreciate you coming by thank today. You. And thank you for your answers. And thanks to those who asked questions. And thanks to everyone who joined us, um, joined us online.